Um, this, this keynote has been a hallmark of State of the Net for, uh, this will be the 15th year, and for the past 14 years, uh, Congressman Bob Goodlatte has, um, has done this fireside chat, and we are thrilled to have uh, Congressman Jim Langevin um, doing the fireside chat today. So I'm really thrilled. Um, Gypsy, before I get going, um, some people, we, there is um, snow in the forecast for tonight. Um, it wouldn't be State of the Net if we didn't have snow in the forecast. <laughs> if anybody knows State of the Net, it is some, um, it's like a snow magnet. They keep saying, like, what are you, like, Elsa, the Princess Elsa from Frozen, Tim? And you attract all the snow. But I think this year we've had so many New Englanders and people from Rhode Island and Massachusetts that brought the snow with them. And I think that's, that's, that's my reasoning on that. But let me introduce um, for the fireside chat, it's Congressman uh, Jim Langevin. Um, he's the chair of the Cybersecurity Caucus um, on the Hill. He's the uh, uh, chairman of, uh, on a lot of different uh, committees that have purview over cybersecurity. So he's perfect uh, to do this fireside chat today. Uh, again, he is from, uh, Rhode the, he is a representative from Rhode Island, just like Congressman uh, Cicilline this morning. Um, in joining him is um, Corey Thomas, who is the CEO of Rapid7. And if you don't know Rapid7, it's a huge cybersecurity company. Um, and I don't, I didn't explain that appropriately, um, but it is a, it's an amazing, amazing company in Massachusetts. Um, uh, Corey is, um, he serves on the Massachusetts Cybersecurity Strategy Council, and he was elected to the Cyber Threat Alliance Board of Directors. So um, let me just hand it off to them, and um, they're going to have some comments, and I think we can do some Q&A afterwards, and then we break for lunch. So let me just hand it off to Corey and Congressman Landry, and thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, one, Congressman, it's such an honor to share the stage with you today, especially in light of everything that's been happening with the government shutdown. You know, I would love to start off by one of the things that has impressed me um, with cybersecurity, especially in this incredibly contentious environment, is that cybersecurity has been and seems to remain a bipartisan issue. How did that develop, um, and where does it go from here? Well, uh, first of all, Corey, great to be sharing the stage with you today, and thank you, and, uh, at, uh, and all you do at Rapid7. And it's great to be up here with a, a fellow New Englander, uh, <laughs> of course, especially with the upcoming Super Bowl uh, coming up, <laughs> and, uh, or as we like to call it in the Northeast and New England, Rhode Island area, the uh, New England Patriots Invitational. For the exactly. <laughs> You're welcome every year. <laughs> but uh, in, in any event, um, yeah, uh, cybersecurity has been a uh, tend to be a, uh, a bipartisan issue, as are most national security issues. Uh, so often, you know, if you're, you're going to see bipartisanship uh, when, you come, when it comes to protecting the country, that's where you'll, uh, you'll see it. So I've got some great colleagues that, uh, that I, I work with, uh, a Republican colleague of mine from Texas, Mike McCall. Uh, he and I co-founded and still co-chair the, the Cybersecurity Caucus. Uh, and, uh, and then also Elise Stefanik, a uh, congresswoman from New York. Uh, she was up until recently the chair of the subcommittee that I now chair on, on, on armed services, and uh, we work very closely together in CII on, on a lot of these issues. Uh, so e even, uh, you know, I have differences with, uh, uh, on significantly in, in uh, many issues with, with President Trump, but I even I give him and the administration a, a lot of credit uh, on a lot of things that they have Done, whether it's the uh, response on the um, uh, the not pet you uh, uh, malware uh, that uh, was one of the worst uh, and and uh, most costly uh, cyber attacks in in, in, in world history, uh, and also the uh, the work that they did on on uh, the WannaCry response, getting a unified response from from allies and condemning North Korea uh, on on that issue, and uh, even the uh, the Trump uh, the executive order. Uh, and cyber was a uh, was a move in the in the right direction. Um, so those are a lot of positive things. I see bipartisanship. Uh, one I have to maybe <laughs> mention one area where we we disagree with the administration uh, on on where we're going because we've had say 25 years of moving in a stronger direction and working together to strengthen uh, cybersecurity for the country. Uh, up until recently when the, the cybersecurity coordinator position at the White House was eliminated. And now more than ever, where we need a whole of government and a whole of nation approach to, uh, to cybersecurity, uh, the person best uh, able to do that and pull it all together as a cybersecurity coordinator, uh, that position, again, was, was eliminated, uh, including, by the way, the cybersecurity advisory position at, uh, at the State Department was also eliminated. Mm. So two major steps backward, but other than that, 
uh, cybersecurity uh, among uh, along with uh, the national security issues had been a bipartisan uh, thing. It, it's interesting that you mention the cybersecurity um, coordinator role and security becoming more national is because when I spend lots of time with our customers, one of the pieces of feedback that I hear is the fragmentation that, that they feel with so many state laws, um, so many different regulatory agencies, uh, and increasingly lots of national frameworks. Uh, I know you've done some work to try to look at national standards. How do we actually think about sort of a cohesive policy environment? So one of the things that you know, customers have to be most uh, worried about is, is when their personal private information uh, is, uh, is, is compromised. And, uh, and then how quickly are they notified and, and how quickly can they respond or what does the, the company do to help in the, in the mitigation and the response. And right now, unfortunately, there are 50 state laws uh, on, the, on the books that govern uh, data breach notification. And uh, that's certainly problematic from on a number of levels. And, and uh, certainly on a, on, a, on a business case standpoint, you can imagine a national company having to comply with uh, 50 different standards. But again, it's, it's the most important thing is to notify customers quickly and then close off uh, those areas where that data can be misused for nefarious gain. Uh, so what I believe is that we it's high time that we have a national standard. So a 30-day uh, data breach notification standard, I worked with uh, the Obama administration on, on this, uh, on uh, trying to establish that kind of a, of a law. Uh, uh, we're going to be reintroducing the bill again uh, this year, and uh, I hope that, uh, that we, can, uh, we can see uh, it get through the, uh, uh, the process. There's uh, the, one of the major holdups, in addition to the, oh, maybe the jurisdictional battles in, in Congress, uh, has one of the big holdups has been feuds about sectors that should be uh, exempt. And, and so we've got to work out uh, on those things. But uh, it's high time, I think, for a data breach notification. I'd love to hear your perspective on, on that as well and, and what you're hearing from, from customers. I, I completely agree with you on the standard. What I would say is that there was a wide... Um, bifurcation in uh, many of our customers' communities. Um, you know, part of what we do is we actually represent our customers. We have over 8,000 customers on cybersecurity issues. And there were some who were just like the weakest possible standards um, are the best, um, and they wanted exemptions and other things. The thing that I would actually point out is that you actually today have a growing consensus that a national framework um, is not just positive, but it's necessary. And a, a big part of that, I think, comes from people are starting to see the pain of the state-by-state state fragmentation that's there. So what I'm observing is that we find lots of business groups um, who are tend to be against any type of increased regulation or oversight, slowly move into a consensus that there has to be a national framework, um, ideally that supersedes state frameworks, because the whole goal is to reduce complexity, uh, but you're seeing an increased consensus that that's a much better situation. So I hope that the data breach work is just the first in an overall national framework. Yeah, I, I, I do too, and uh, I think it's a lot of, I think it's, there's, there's great momentum behind that kind of, a, of an effort in the bill uh, getting through Congress finally. It's nice to see, you know, uh, the, the, the private sector and government coming together and certainly the, the heavy uh, push also not only for customers, but also from, from the business community to see that move forward. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it'll slowly evolve over time. I think, you know, I think just like you and Congress um, have disagreements over, although you overall agree that it needs to move forward, mm -hmm. I think the business community is divided about sort of like what's the right level of standards, mm -hmm. um, what type of things should be encouraged versus not discouraged. So, you know, I personally have a disagreement with some folks in the business community on the value of security research which um, your office has been quite helpful on actually working through. Um, but I do think we're seeing increasing norms on the value of having a consolidated framework. Uh, agreed, yeah. agreed. So, um, you know, in, in terms of the, you know, creating a, a healthier ecosystem too, in, in general with uh, uh, the, uh, the internet, what do you th see uh, cybersecurity researchers uh, playing a role in this, and I'd love to give you, you know, my perspective, but it's a jury practitioner, I'd love to hear, uh, hear your thoughts on this. Well, I think, so for those of you not familiar with, so cybersecurity researchers, essentially they go out and test all the technology that we use every day. 
Um, and then ideally what we advocate is that they constructively reach out to vendors and actually say, here are holes and vulnerabilities that we found. Uh, please fix them, and we will actually make the information available to the public within a reasonable time frame. Um, and so we believe in that responsible um, style of disclosure around these things. The reason that I'm so passionate about it, I think it's hugely important, is that um, if you think about what it takes to solve cybersecurity, it's a community effort. Um, the one thing that we know about software and technology, and I speak to this as someone who's actually been in the technology in industry and written technology my entire life, is that it will inherently come with bugs and vulnerabilities. The question is, do the bad guys have proprietary access to the vulnerabilities that we all are living with, or is that information shared with the broad community, and are we working to actually minimize the overall attack surface? Uh, and so we've been working together with a increasing set of companies, technology companies, and industrial companies around the world to actually really evolve to this shared responsibility and this coordinated vulnerability disclosure model that actually makes it safe for cybersecurity researchers to do their work in the overall ecosystem. Yeah, and, and I think they, they play a, a vital role in, in helping to strengthen the ecosystem going forward. And I'm excited about the interactions that, that I've had uh, with uh, the cybersecurity researcher community. Uh, sometimes they call them the breakers uh, or the hackers, and they've been kind of given a bad rap over the, over the years. Um, what was your, by the way, what was your experience at DEF CON? I think you just yeah. recently went and spent some time with that research community. I'm I did. I, I, was, uh, I was thrilled to be and really honored to, to be the first uh, sitting member of Congress to go to DEF CON along with my colleague, uh, Will Hurd, from uh, Texas. Again, the bipartisan visit. And, and, uh, and he and I had a chance to go and, and tour the, the various uh, hacker villages and the different things that they were, uh, they were working on. But I was very impressed with how uh, passionate about uh, they are about strengthening the uh, the ecosystem overall. You know, we often create we, we celebrate the, uh, uh, the the creators of the internet, uh, Vint Cerf and Tim uh, Berners Lee, and and uh, they did a great thing in in, in in creating this thing that the, we now know as the as the internet. Uh, but a lot of people uh, in the cybersecurity research community uh, want to understand how things work, how to make it better, and so we rely on these breakers or the hackers, if you will. Uh, to point out the vulnerabilities and, and find out, you know, work together to uh, uh, to close the vulnerabilities and just get the internet to work really as it was intended. One of the more exciting things that I saw uh, happen in, in the last several years is the um, uh, the hack the Pentagon program that, mm. that came out. So Ash Carter, then the Secretary of Defense, uh, was a was a uh, really the facilitator and the and the driver in this in this effort. And because of the work that uh, that you know that, that he allowed to happen and, and it went it went forward, you saw a, a significant number of vulnerabilities in, uh, in in DOCD systems identified, and those vulnerabilities closed in a very short amount of time. So, uh, creating more of these bug bounty or hack the bank on type programs for government is uh, is important. But again, we we have to make it uh, conducive for these white hat white hat uh, hackers to come and be part of the process to make the internet. Uh, stronger. And I know we're looking at, I know there's several different laws um, that I think your office has been working on and others have been working on um, to improve that overall thing. I would say I think it becomes more essential and more important today. Um, the way I think about it is more and more of our society is based on technology. So if you think about the, um, the percentage of our overall environment that's based on technology, it continues to go up at an astounding rate. Um, and that does introduce systematic risk into the overall ecosystem. And so while I'm a technologist, I believe deeply in technologist, when you look at everything from the amount of applications to IoT to our supply chain, I have grave concerns about sort of uh, ensuring that we stay ahead of the game there. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those things that kind of that, that, that keeps me up late, late at night is uh, supply chain uh, security. It's, it's a multiple layers, right? Um, you know, First of all, uh, one of the things that, that I do worry about uh, is, is securing the, uh, the supply chain from the, 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 the large major defense contractors all the way down through the, through the subcontractors and the people that they're doing business with, right? Because you're only strong, again, as your as you're weak, weakest link. You think some of the, the, the highest uh, profile hacks that have, that have occurred, uh, they didn't come through the, 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 the front doors of their uh, major company cyber defenses 
uh, with a brute force attack. It was more uh, of a, uh, they get into a, say, a, a third party contractor and they, you know, a, a company and they, then they move sideways. And so we need to be concerned about that uh, on, on the, the DOD side and the, the, uh, the major defense contractor system as well. And then you have to worry about also um, the uh, uh, systems that are non uh, DOD systems. So you know the uh, universities, for example, and the, the research that that happens uh, initially at the unclassified level, and then it soon is, is going to be uh, classified. And 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 uh, that uh, we have had terabytes of uh, very sensitive research and data stolen, hacked, uh, exfiltrated. And that's something else that, that, that really uh, keeps me up uh, late at night. And then also uh, weapon system uh, security is another area I think that we need to uh, worry about. And that goes back into the, the, the supply team chain, making sure that uh, all these systems are secure and, and also oversees uh, the, the components that are, that are produced for sensitive uh, weapon systems. So uh, yeah, supply chain security is going to be a very big focus of what my uh, subcommittee uh, continues to highlight and uh, do a deep dive on. But you know, how about your experience with uh, uh, supply chain and your thoughts would be? It, it, it's interesting hearing it from the federal government side because you have a different, very big issue. Um, but I would say it translates quite well to the commercial side. If you actually think about most companies have no clue what technology is deployed in the environment. If you think about IoT devices, everything from the light bulbs, and the Alexa style devices that we actually talk about every day, more and more technology is all around us. And the challenge that many organizations have is they have no clue what's the technology that's in their environment that they're relying on. And this technology has sensors, it has cameras, it has microphones. I mean, we just saw the issue um, with the iPhones today. Um, and all of these things can be used for all types of purposes. One of the things that scares me the most, even though I think it's manageable, though, is that every company in almost every sector is becoming a technology um, company. So whether you look at sort of like the trucking and logistics area, where I just met with a fantastic company, but they're essentially turning the entire um, logistics infrastructure into basically a precision science based on technology. Uh, if you look at retail, if you look at healthcare, uh, I'm on the board of an insurer and I spend lots of time in healthcare, is that entire apparatus is actually um, being increasingly connected to the internet and connected all across the healthcare infrastructure. The challenge is, is we know that big companies, whether it's sort of like um, companies like Rapid7 or companies that we all rely on every day have cybersecurity issues. What happens when you actually have um, your traditional industrial manufacturers that are deploying technology um, that we all use and rely on every day. And so I think that attack surface and that attack footprint just continues to grow and expand. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, the um, you, automated systems have brought great efficiencies and, and, uh, and, and uh, help companies to, to operate a, a, at a higher level. But with those efficiencies have come at, at, a, at a cost as well because it, it, it does broaden your, your attack surface. And, um, and so uh, the, the, the things we can do to, to narrow that attack surface are essential. And uh, going back to whether it's practicing good uh, cyber hygiene, uh, which, is, uh, which is important uh, when you're updating your security patches or uh, having strong passwords using two-factor authentication. And such. So, again, all those little things uh, very done to the, the employee level will, um, will narrow that, that attack surface. And then you need uh, more, I guess you'd say, exquisite systems to do the, more the, the, the high-end things. Now, of course, you know, part of all this, uh, in, in addition to cyber education for, for employees and having the right uh, technology uh, in place to, uh, to mitigate cyber threats, is also the, the issue of the, 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 the cybersecurity workforce. And, and uh, I, I, it's been my experience we're having significant shortages in, in this field, and, and uh, I, there's things that I can talk about that, that, I, that I support that trying to uh, get more people going to the cybersecurity uh, field, but what's your experience been from a, uh, from a practitioner's standpoint? So the data we see says there's several million jobs that are expected over the next few years that are gaps. Uh, I can tell you, as someone who hires cybersecurity professionals, the time to fill is extending. Um, you know, good for the cybersecurity workforce that the price that you pay go up. 
I do think that that actually is creating a society of have and have nots where companies that can actually pay for their really expensive labor um, have access to it. And those that can't really have a huge issue there. And so I'm really, I, I think government plays a huge role and I'm interested in what you're doing to actually help incentivize sort of a larger cybersecurity workforce. So um, one of the programs I'm a big fan of is the Cyber Club program. Uh, it's a, a, a partnership between uh, uh, NSF and, and the uh, and, uh, Department of Homeland Security and incentivizes young people uh, in college to go into the cybersecurity uh, field. So if a school is designated as a cyber center of excellence and the student uh, can apply for it if they get accepted to the Cyber Corps program, uh, basically their college is paid for in their junior and senior year, they get a stipend of uh, $22,500 a, a year, and then they have a, 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 um, a, they have a service component when they, when they graduate and they agree to go into a, a cybersecurity position at the local, state, or the, or the federal level for, for two years. And you know, it, it, they're, they're, certainly they're, they're, they're fulfilling their requirement uh, to, to give back during those two years. But it also introduces them to this, you know, this uh, idea of uh, uh, mission-driven uh, employment. And obviously, they're, they're, um, they're, important. they're filling a very important, uh, important need. So, this is something that I, I suppose we need to have more of these types of programs. And by the way, uh, this is something that I've in, in concept and we've been working with the private sector to see how we can have a similar type of program but introduce it to young people at the, at the high school level so that as they're graduating, they, can think, they think of you know, going into this type of program right from the, uh, right the get-go. And, and uh, I think that's something that's, that's great uh, potential. Um, the, other, the other thing I will say is, uh, we, we need to have a, uh, a more sophisticated um, uh, workforce for those people that are dealing with uh, technology systems, and especially when we talk about bringing uh, great efficiency, say, in the, in the uh, electric or the operational, maybe technology uh, space, if you will, and people that are connecting things to the Internet, right, and making yes. sure you're there, and when you think about uh, say the the electric grid. They're steeped in this culture of uh, of safety and and uh, you know not leaving switches open yep. or uh, you know uh, security cabinets uh, uh, unlocked, if you will, that uh, that allow you to access to to control systems. But um, necessarily making sure that your 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 uh, when you're connecting devices, that those things are password protected, or that that the the people that are responsible for overseeing the system know that a new device is, has been connected to the system. Uh, there's so many places they don't even know what's connected to their network, and yet these things are uh, uh, either uh, not password protected or they have the default password of password, and, and yes. so it's easy to get into. But you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. No, we still see that today, unfortunately, is that um, poor passwords are a plague that will never go away no matter how much noise we put in. Uh, I see that we probably need to actually shift to asking some questions. So, if anyone has questions um, for the congressman myself, please. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a dance to get there. Uh, thank you for being here, Congressman. Um, my question is. So you've noted the jurisdictional issues that have sometimes hamstrung these efforts. What's your plan for tackling that with the reintroduction of the 30-day data breach notification law? Uh, yeah, sure. let's stop there. So um, I've already had a, a conversation with, uh, with Speaker Pelosi about the, the, the jurisdictional issues. So right now, again, going back to my frustration about uh, the, the multiple jurisdiction cyber, there are some 80 different committees and subcommittees that claim some type of jurisdiction over, over cybersecurity. And hence, it's the, the reason why we've been slow to see a, a, a more bills make its way through Congress that would, would strengthen, strengthen, I believe, our, our cybersecurity posture. Uh, it took a long time, several years, for the, the CISA legislation to get through Congress. That's the, the information sharing legislation uh, that, uh, that, that helped to bring down the barriers for government sharing threat data with the private sector and private sector sharing threat data back with the, uh, uh, with the government. But getting, you know, more specifically again to your question on the 30-day uh, law, I, I, 
there's, there's a uh, committee looking at um, um, congressional reform right now and, and how we might streamline Congress. This is certainly one of those things. And I've made the, the point to the, to the speaker that, look, we as a Congress are going to have to move with greater agility to respond to the cybersecurity threats that we face going forward. And we can't do it under the current construct. And so uh, I'm hoping that as we look at uh, some form of, of oversight reform, that that's going to be a part of, of, of streamlining that. And I've said to her directly, look, it's like the, uh, the uh, when we had to move this massive uh, bill through the Congress on, on health care reform, and, and uh, of course that you know, wasn't a, a perfect process or a perfect bill that came out. But you know, it was the, the speaker at the time who stepped in and said, this is how we're going to do it. These committees are going to have primary jurisdiction. You're going to have a certain amount of time to you know, mark up the bill, move its way through, but it is going to happen. And that's the type of thing that needs to happen with cybersecurity. Other questions? Mark McCarthy, U.S. Uh, SIA in Georgetown. Uh, I want to ask a question about the international dimension of, of cybersecurity. Uh, in, in many jurisdictions, um, the important need for, for good safety and security with technology products uh, really gives way to a, a concern about um, allowing U.S. products and services to be fully uh, available to people in other countries. Um, to what extent do you think it's possible to disentangle the legitimate concerns about cybersecurity from, from these um, other issues that may be motivated more by, by protecting domestic competitors uh, or getting an edge up uh, in, in the area of standards development that will allow their own companies to uh, move ahead in the international competition in this area? Yeah. Well, I mean, tech transfer is always going to be uh, a, a, a concern. And, um, you know, I, I know we live in a global economy and, and where it's appropriate. Obviously, we want uh, our technology to, and our innovation to be able to proliferate around the world. But at the same time, when it comes to uh, protecting uh, proprietary technology, uh, that's something we have to be mindful of as well. So I don't know if I have a really good answer on that, but um, uh, other than to say that where it's appropriate, uh, you know, I want to see uh, uh, competition and economic opportunities uh, proliferate, but uh, being mindful of uh, protecting uh, our, our exquisite technologies, especially as they relate to defense industry and protecting those uh, you know, perhaps dual-use technologies to the degree that we that is appropriate. And, um, you know, one comment I would make as someone who actually uh, has to sell and operate in lots of countries, I actually think it is possible. I would say many countries right now are viewing how do they actually get a larger share of the technology economy. And so there is some desire to create artificial um, barriers there. And my worry is that the tendency tends to go up. The thing that I would say is that I think it has to become a trade priority and a policy priority for uh, our trade officials um, to ensure that there is a open markets and a level playing field from a technology perspective also. I think we tend to focus um, lots on level playing fields um, in industrials and in the agricultural economy. But if you look at the strategic value of the technology economy as we go forward, and yes, it comes with some strong negatives, but um, we would rather have that market here in the US I would say it has been under-prioritized from a trade perspective. Um, and I actually think that it is addressable if we start to prioritize it more. Hi. This, I think this is the last question, and according to Tim, so I always take my, <laughs> my cue from Tim. Um, Rick Lane, the CEO of Iggy Ventures. I've been working with a coalition of security experts who have been very concerned about the impact of the GDPR on the WHOIS database and the openness and being able to do um, searches and research um, as well as stopping phishing, malware, and others. Um, have you been made aware of the impact of the GDPR on the WHOIS and its impact on our national cybersecurity efforts? Um, so yeah, I, I know that that, uh, that uh, GDPR has, has gone a long way toward protecting uh, personal and, and private information, and, and certainly there's some lessons learned that, uh, that you know, perhaps we can take away from here. But I'm not sure exactly I understand. Uh, you want to elaborate a little bit more on your, on your, on your question from that standpoint? And I, I may can actually add some framing to it also. So I think one of the things that happens, especially when you have lots of phishing attacks, when people are impersonating others, is that you attempt to actually verify 
um, that the person is who they say there is. Who is is one source amongst many sources that are uh, that are out there. I think one of the issues and the questions that people have is that, um, like any policy or any bill, sometimes there's negative externalities that people don't think through um, that's there. And we've definitely seen um, negative externalities specifically in the ability to investigate that the originator of emails, content, and communication is who they say is. Who else is one factor, but it also goes to, as you think about the positive impacts of actually being able to track behaviors of users over time to say, is this user behaving in the same way? Well, if you start limiting what you can actually track, it takes away um, methods of confirming that a person is who they say there is. So there's some ne negative externalities. From my perspective, uh, I think everything is negative. The question is, uh, do policymakers respond and make common sense adjustments along the way, or do we stay in a murky world? All right, thank you. Everybody, thank you, and the congressman, for taking the time today. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you. And we're going to break for lunch. And speaking of GDPR, we'll be right back here after lunch for a GDPR panel that includes also the California Privacy Law. So thank you, and um, we'll see you back here in about an hour. Thank you. <laughs>